Um, this is a, a Friday lunchtime session in the UK and it's something the Academy will be having for a while, but it's a slightly different format today. We're going to have a conversation or I'm going to have a conversation with Jennifer um, based on the uh, questions that some of you have submitted uh, and, and other things that she has been saying and doing in recent times. So I just wanted to say a warm welcome to everyone wherever you're joining from. I know we've got people I think coming from um, Asia, probably from Bilbao. Uh, welcome to Rosina from uh, Brussels and Wolf I think is joining us uh, from Freiburg. Uh, Lots of the rest are coming from across the UK and Ireland, but if I've missed anyone out, uh, uh, please, please, uh, a warm welcome and I hope you have a, uh, an enjoyable session. Our guest today is Jennifer Kiesmatt, who, as many of you will know, is an honorary academician, uh, widely renowned, particularly for her period as Chief City Planner at the City of Toronto, but also for her bid as a candidate for Mayor of the City. She's currently Chief Exec of the Kismat Group, and we'll hear more about what she's been doing there. But I just wanted to say um, a warm welcome to you, Jennifer. I know it's earlier in the morning for you. Um, how, how are things in Toronto? Mute, could it demute? Good thing you asked that. Things are, things are pretty good. That's great. Um, I just wanted to put the context for, for everyone. Some people will know you from your uh, visit to us in London or from Milton Keynes when you were made an honorary academician. But uh, you're, you're, you've built a growing reputation in Canada, not only in Toronto, but more widely as a communicator and an advocate for um, more livable places. And you're seen as a sort of powerful voice. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about the, the declaration of resilient cities that you were involved in earlier in the year. But from our point of view, you sit very well with our um, range of honorary academicians, like Wolf Dasseking from Freiburg and Krista Larsen from Malmo. Um, you've been an influential uh, planning director, like Tina Sobi from Copenhagen. You've decided to leave that post, that senior post, and, and seek other things, advise other people and other parties. But like George Ferguson of Bristol and Manuel Salgado of Lisbon, you've entered the fray as an urbanist in, in the political world. Um, and that's uh, very combative. Like many of the others that we've got, Jan Gale, Alan Baxter, John Worthington, and our, our um, uh, chair, John Thompson, you've also been advising people, not only in your own country, but around the world um, in, in many different countries. So we're interested to hear what you're doing, but also as we work through today, what your thoughts are from the current sort of COVID-19 situation and looking to the future. But before we start, I, I think uh, our, our audience would be quite interested to know how you got started. How did you get into this? Because as I understand it, uh, this wasn't your first degree topic. Uh, you, you came into it. So how, how did you get into this field of, of work and, and uh, who inspired you or led you in that direction? Well, thank you, Kevin. Um, the the story that I think we're going to hear over the course of the next hour is going to wind in a variety of different ways, uh, but it might come full circle because you've started in this place. I was a graduate from the University of Western Ontario with a combined honors degree in English and philosophy, and I realized I really needed to get my hands dirty. And I wanted to be engaged in the world around me and shaping the world around me. I'd had enough of philosophy for a little bit. But ironically, of course, um, I've spent the rest of my career looking for urban planners with philosophy degrees as a background because I think that um, it's excellent training because at its essence, urbanism and urban planning is about how we manifest our values in the world. And so when I had graduated, I became in, involved in some advocacy work in Vancouver, where I was living at the time, around building affordable housing. And in particular, there was a neighborhood with an old warehouse that was about to be gentrified by a condo developer, and there were squatters in the warehouse. And the question was, where will these squatters go? And I was involved, it was my very first act of community organizing, and I was involved in what eventually led to uh, the stopping of the condo development, the purchasing of the land by the city, and the city putting out the land into a bidding process to create mixed use housing that included social housing and affordable housing as part of the overall development. And that's built today. It's called the Woodward's Project or the Woodward's Development. 
But what that did was it, um, I wasn't a planner. I knew nothing about planning at this time. What it did was realize, what, what was it, it helped me realize that through our actions, we can fundamentally transform the world around us. And at that time, someone said to me, um, are, are, you, are you an urban planner? And I literally um, stared back and said, what's an urban planner? I, I had no idea. And so I, you know, I, I went off and read Jane Jacobs, went to planning school, and uh, as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> you really came into communi community activism in terms of a background. You, you're renowned as a communicator. Have you got any background in performing or singing or debating? Is there any of that strand in, in either you or your family? Well, interestingly, there is. Um, we have something here in Canada. I don't know, you might have it in um, Britain as well, called the Qantas Music Festival. And it's uh, a competition for children to perform in the musical arts, but also in public speaking. And for reasons I can't explain, when I was nine years old, my mother enrolled me uh, in a public speaking competition when I was just nine. And I was too little to be nervous. I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, from that point on, over the next several years, I participated in public speaking, um, reciting prose, competitions. And what's so interesting about it is it ended up laying a foundation for speaking to the public and speaking to, to the audience, to audiences, um, and to really realizing again, I think as a very small child, that the things we say and our words and the way we communicate them can actually change people's hearts and minds. And so I saw the power in that. And that inspired me to um, continue to be involved. And I, I obviously had somewhat of an aptitude for it, so I wasn't really afraid of it. Um, you know, my great claim to fame is that I never get nervous. Although when I ran for mayor, I was incredibly nervous. Um, for the first time in my life, I was like, oh, now I understand what it's like to get really nervous. You know, sweat running down the back of your, down your back. I'd never experienced that, but the stakes were very different when I ran for mayor and I got very, very nervous. But, but um, you know, for, because I think because I've been speaking publicly since I was quite young, uh, it's something that has enabled me to connect with audiences and that has turned out to be a very powerful, a very powerful tool. That's good. When, when we teach um, students, we find often the ones who've got an acting or, or musical background, as you have, are mm -hmm. more comfortable presenting and, and the others take a bit longer. So. Uh, that sounds familiar and 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 that does explain your comfort in front of an audience um can i just move on in terms of as your career developed where, from uh, it could be before you started studying planning but uh, certainly from then were there any key influences either people or documents or places that were doing things yes um i went on to planning school and uh following planning school i began working in a large planning and design firm uh here in toronto and uh you know i was listening to the thought leaders around me and so at that time um probably one of the thought leaders that i was most interested in and this came from my uh and i would say that this is a thought leader who's had the most influence on me at a very practical level was Larry Beasley, who was the former chief planner in Vancouver. And the reason he had such an impact on me was because it was, he had a key message that connected with me at a really visceral level because I cared about communities. I cared about how people live. That was how I came into this. Uh, and he, Larry often talked about how the legitimacy we have in the work that we do is when we meet our civic obligations. Uh, but also when we build constituencies that support and advocate for the uh, ideas and work that we bring to the table. And so when I became chief planner, I really was preoccupied with this question of how I could build constituencies who supported a different kind of city and a different kind of urbanism really from the one in the direction that we were going in. And so in many ways in, in COVID-19, I've, I've seen that come to fruition as, uh, and there were many, many players over many years who've been involved in many ways. 
Um, but I've seen that come to fruition because all of those seeds that we planted and a lot of the groundwork that we did, uh, you know, now people are saying, oh, I, I kind of get it. I get bike lanes. I, I, I get how critical it is to have affordable housing in every part of the city so that key workers and essential workers don't have a long commute, particularly in moments like this. So that idea, and I think probably one of the, the, the most profound ideas for me was, um, uh, was this idea of that you don't actually have any legitimacy. We don't have any legitimacy as a profession to be doing the work that we're doing unless we're working in a very intimate way with the constituencies that we serve. And whether we're in the private sector or the public sector, we serve. Our work is about, it is about the public. And that was something that has, has always been very powerful to me. The other idea I'll just add is I was very much influenced early on by the Congress for New Urbanism in America. And we didn't really have a Canadian equivalent, but many um, Canadians who were urban designers like myself, um, we were very influenced by that movement and the notion that we needed, well, you know, I used to always call it the Congress for Old Urbanism because uh, old urbanist principles and you know, I developed very early on in my career, and it's something that I've used almost religiously for 20 years now, what I've called timeless principles of urbanism. And they're a combination of process and design, and they're very much influenced by the thinking of Larry Beasley and his work in Vancouver. A lot of what I experimented with in terms of public process in the Toronto context, something I approach very differently, but also much of the design influence of the Congress for New Urbanism. That, that sounds familiar too. That if, um, for those who don't know uh, on this uh, session, the Academy itself was influenced. Um, in fact, I have a feeling we call our Congress a Congress because of the CNU, um, but a number of our members were, were, were going out and visiting it. And indeed, uh, a lot of us went to places like Seaside to, to study that in uh, the year that we were founded. I just want to take uh, you back to some of those early years as you were uh, evolving as a young professional. How was it, and this is coming from a question several have asked, both some of our older urbanists, but, but a number of the young urbanists and students. How was it like as a woman progressing in what was sometimes seen as the development industry? Were there uh, barriers or how were you treated and how did you manage to progress? Um, because that, that's a big issue in lots of places still, but we, I think we're intrigued as to whether um, in Canada and Toronto things were more enlightened or was it quite a challenge? Well, you know, I can't really give a comparative analysis because I only have my own experience, but um, I was raised up in a male profession with, you know, men were my mentors. Um, other than Jane Jacobs, who must be mentioned because she had a profound influence on my contrarian thinking, I would say. Um, and like many women of my age, I can probably tell you a lot of horror stories of things that happened to me and um, experiences I had in a professional context that without a doubt we know are deeply unacceptable and inappropriate. But you know, Kind of strangely, um, I knew that I was pioneering and, you know, for better or worse, I knew, well, if I'm going to get something done and have an impact, I'm going to have to stick my elbows out and just work really hard. And so I did that. I stuck my elbows out. I worked really hard. I created a very distinct philosophy around working with other women in my profession because um, it wasn't always other women, whether it was architects or planners who were very kind to me. That wasn't, that wasn't the case. So I created a counter philosophy, which I talked about a lot when I was chief planner. I was the first woman chief planner in the city of Toronto, and I inherited a team of nine directors who were all men. So the leadership in the overall planning department was deeply, deeply imbalanced. And it was you know, I would argue it was imbalanced in a whole variety of, of, of ways, but in particular around gender, it was deeply imbalanced. And so that philosophy, which is what I like to, hope, like to focus on, is that, you know, I had to yank really hard on a lot of doors. 
um, to get my work done. And it took a lot of energy and a lot of tenacity, but I didn't care. I was just like, oh, this is what you have to do to do this. I'm going to do it. And I was aided along the way by many incredible, incredible people. But I didn't want the women around me to have to pull as hard. And so what I talked a lot about as chief planner and I talk a lot about now and what I try to do now is to hold the door open for other women in the profession. I don't want it to be so hard for the women around me who are uh, capable and talented and necessary to our urbanism. I don't want it to be as hard for them as it has been for me. And so I talk about this idea a lot because I think um, it's something that men and women um, need to think about is the way that they're holding the door open for others around them who, for a variety of reasons, whether it's systemic racism or whether it's a background that has made them disadvantaged or, or it's their, uh, their gender, uh, that we need to become conscious of holding the door open for one another within our profession so that we can get uh, more people thriving and contributing and um, you know, let's face it, there's, there, it's not a competition. There's an endless amount of work to be done uh, within our field. So let's make sure that ca talented, capable people um, aren't facing unnecessary barriers to participation in our profession. And, and, and that you, you've talked about that in terms of the profession. I know you've also uh, talked about it in terms of wider community engagement too. Can you say something about we're interested in a number of people have asked about this too we've, we've got the um, Black Lives Matter situation that's emanated from um, America or USA but it's 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 echoed around the world you have diverse ethnic populations in Toronto um, how does that work in terms of inclusion the kinds of neighborhoods we aspire to have whether people feel that they have a role in the uh, decision making in the city and also as you've just alluded to in, in careers and progression and the fairness of, of, of uh, that kind of approach. I say this because the Academy is going through its own thinking on this and I know that uh, the Royal Town Planning Institute has issued an important document on, on the same topic earlier in the year. So we're interested in, in your thoughts and obviously the, um, the, the, the gender ones you've just referred to are very powerful but how are the other aspects mm -hmm. of um, ethnicity and inclusion and, and fairness um, evolving in Canada? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I'll say is that um, you know, I, I think our profession and um, Torontonians have been deeply affected and impacted to see our world in a different way as a result of Black Lives Matter. Um, we've been having a rigorous debate here about the role of the police and defunding the police. Um, and it's a critical, necessary conversation. Um, for a whole variety of for a whole variety of reasons, and just to link this into the moment in history we're in in COVID nineteen, uh, we have seen and as a result of some wonderful advocates in this city, we've collected race based data on COVID nineteen, and we have seen that there is a um, uh, there's a racialized aspect to COVID nineteen, not unlike there is in in America. So. There's a, a lot of those issues are, there's degrees of separation, um, but there's significant and critical and important issues in the Toronto context as well. So let me begin with saying that. We are 51% non-white and 50% of the residents in the city were not born in Toronto. They were born somewhere else. Uh, so that kind of impacts the conversation here as, as well. So keep that stat in mind for a minute. When I was chief planner, um, I was uh, advancing an LRT line through a neighborhood that desperately needed it. And uh, the residents kept coming out to protest the LRT, they didn't want it. But I went back and looked at the demographic data in the neighborhood and um, it was actually a very poor neighborhood, relatively speaking, it was a racialized neighborhood and it, it, you know, there was a, it, it was, it didn't make sense. So the next meeting, and we subsequently did this moving forward, I asked my planners to collect data on who, who came to the meeting. And we discovered, not surprisingly, and as a result of that exercise, we collected data for the whole city on who participated in our consultation processes. 
and we discovered that the participants at the meeting were overwhelmingly homeowners, even though 50% of the residents in the city of Toronto rent. So it was overwhelmingly homeowners, they were overwhelmingly white, they were overwhelmingly male, and they were overwhelmingly over 55 years old. So, and that was, that was the audience whose comments were being used to legitimize recommendations to city council. So not even remotely representative of the residents in the city. So I did something very unique, which you can Google, it's been widely studied. Um, I actually got the idea by kind of copying what we do on projects and I made it something bigger. So I adapted an idea and I created something called the community reference panel uh, uh, for the planning department. And we initiated a, <clears throat> we initiated a civic lottery. 28,000 invitations were invited out. And then 28 people were selected to be on this panel. And we used a whole variety of diversity filters. So we wanted people who were very young and very old. We wanted 50% renters, 50% owners, 50% men, 50% uh, women. We wanted representation from the LGBT trans community. We wanted representation um, from every geography in the city. So we had all these different filters. And then we created this panel that acted as an advisory body. And the goal was that this panel would, would be a check for us, but it was also a capacity building exercise. One of the criteria to be on the panel was that you couldn't have been on a committee, run for office. It had to be br new voices that we were bringing into the process. And this to this day continues to be an incredibly powerful way of checking public policy. And it's much better than a community meeting, I will argue, because community meetings often get tripped up by local powerful interests. And this committee isn't local and it has a different kind of power, but not the power you see, the kind of power dynamics that play out at the, lo at the local level. So um, the, you can actually, it's called the planning review panel. You can Google planning review panel and it will pop up. There's a little video there and you can watch the video and you'll see that, you know, there's people with disabilities. There's, you know, there's, there's an incredible array of participants. And that I think, you know, my big vision when I ran for mayor was that I was going to implement that kind of a panel for the entire city and for every policy as a way of taking things out of these very localized, powerful um, interests and as a way of adding diverse perspectives and voices to the, to the process. So I say that by way as one example of the, I think we need to think better about um, when we do have power as, you know, as the chief planner of the city of Toronto, I had considerable power. Um, council didn't directly implement that, um, but to ask this question as to how we can have a process that better represents the interests of the entire city. Um, and I think, you know, if we govern that way, it, it could be transformative. I think it, it, it sounds familiar. And uh, I recall some on the, on this session, may remember Sheffield was one city that had a similar process. Um, I think a hundred people they took. And as you said, it was about all of policy. It wasn't just about planning and it, it was for the whole city. Um, and they were quite a pretty daunting group to go in front of, which, which we had to do a couple of times because they knew their own city better than anyone else. Exactly. And we did, um, what we did with the group was in the beginning, we did several days of capacity building around helping them understand decision making. We gave them like a civics 101 course at the beginning, um, but it would be daunting for exactly that reason. They're going to think their experience of the city. I'll, I'll just tell you one quick story. We had um a taxi driver who had never volunteered for anything in his life he was born in somalia he came to canada in the 70s he raised three children all three children had now graduated from university and when this arrived in the mail he said now it's time now it's time for me to give back think about the perspective i love talking to taxi drivers because they see and hear so much um, they're always my first line of reconnaissance if I'm not taking transit in the city. You know, he was an incredibly valuable perspective and member of advising the planning staff at, this, at the city of Toronto. 
Yes, and it's great when individuals get the opportunity to act for more than just themselves or their own family or household. They can take a bigger perspective, and it's amazing how how great advice they what great advice they can give. Um, we're talking now a bit about Toronto. I wonder if you can say more. Not everyone um, who's listening will have visited. Um, some, if they visited Canada, might have been to other cities uh, like Vancouver or Halifax or, or wherever. So could you say a bit about it? And, and, and in, it's really to lead into your thoughts on whether you think um, Toronto can be a 15-minute city. I know that you've talked about and thought about this and, and talked to others uh, like Carlos Moreno on it. So um, it, it's almost like the, the structure of the city and the nature of it. Um, we Many of us will know Toronto because we see it on television, but it's not always acting as itself. Sometimes it's serving for some Midwest city like Chicago or, or it's acting as LA in, in the same way that Vancouver has done in other movies and, and um, television series. So we're interested in a little bit about the place and, and, and what it could become, because I know you're thinking a lot about that at the moment. Well, you know, I'll start with the back end of the story, which is that um, uh, when I was chief planner at one point, we were putting in bike lanes along a corridor that's often used for movie shoots. And someone in the film office said to us, um, we can't have bike lanes on this corridor because um, it will distinguish Toronto. <laughs> It, it, you know, like it won't be a good set anymore. And the, oh, the irony of that statement from so many perspectives, including the misunderstanding that cities around the world now have bike lanes and you're a better stand in for New York or Paris if you have a bike lane um, or many cities was, was very ironic to me. But also this idea that the city wasn't a real place but instead was a set was something that I found quite fascinating. Um, so I actually think we are moving farther and farther away from being a good set uh, because we are becoming more and more distinct as a city. And it was the fact that we were in our infancy as building out our built form that made us a good set. And the more and more distinct that we become, the less I think that is, that is going to be so. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting, you know, an interesting dilemma, I think, for a city that builds its... Um, uh, has built a big part of its economy around the film industry, as we absolutely have in the Toronto con in context. And we want to keep those jobs moving, moving forward. So Toronto is a city of 2.9 million people. We were amalgamated in 1997. We were seven municipalities. So very different from the, what I would call small government context that exists in the UK. That 2.9 million people in a geography of 613 square kilometers actually has one mayor, one city council, one chief planner, one, one fire department, one. So it's a, it's a superstructure, even on a North American scale. We're the fourth largest city in North America after uh, New York, um, well, yeah, New York, Mexico City and Los Angeles were, num were number four. And um, we, Chicago was number five, for example. Um, and in part that's because we just bumped in the past couple of years with traded places with the Chicago because we're growing so quickly. And so part of our vision for growth in our city has been, as we grow and add more people, can we transform and become something fundamentally different? Can we become a resilient city? Can we become a walkable city? Can we add more people without adding more cars? Can we add more people? And as we add more people, improve our air quality. So our air quality is significantly better than it was 10 years ago. Green roofs, uh, a whole variety of different other policies have had a profound impact on that. But so far, so good. We're actually meeting that objective of growing and changing, but becoming something better. And this is where the 15 minute city actually becomes, in some ways I would say a powerful um, visionary framework that does apply in the Canadian context. It's not being broadly used in the Canadian context, but it does apply. And I think it's a catchy frame for a lot of things that we've been doing for many years, like taking our main corridors that are primarily two stories We've been adapting them by adding Main Street retail, adding new housing, and really creating a walkable neighborhood in our suburbs. And so 
there are parts of Toronto, the older parts of Toronto that are the old city of Toronto prior to amalgamation that are already a 15 minute city. And in fact, in our downtown core, which has a density equivalent to London, England, in our downtown core, 75% of residents walk or cycle to, well, pre-COVID, they walked or cycled to work every day. So we already had a phenomenal modal ship hap happen in those areas. The bigger, more challenging question for the city of Toronto is really our low density suburbs, which take up the vast amount of our land area. And in Canada, 75% of new growth over the course of the past 10 years has actually been low density suburbs. So we've been creating a problem that we're trying to fix as we're trying to fix it. It's a bit absurd. I've been quite vocal about this. We actually know we're just creating a problem when we're creating more of it. We need to stop that. Um, I see the 15 minute city as a framework, particularly for our suburbs as very powerful because it does something incredibly simple. It plants the seed about a dream. It plants the seed about a life without a long commute. And inherent to life in our suburbs today is a long commute. And, you know, in normal times, in the, uh, you know, outside the boundaries of a pan out pandemic, the average commute time in Toronto was 43 minutes prior to uh, the pandemic. So what if we start thinking about adapting our suburbs, integrating a bit more density in a variety of housing forms, which is actually critical to social inclusion, but also a mix of uses that allow people to live in a big city in, for, their, for their everyday tasks within their neighborhood. That's the opportunity in the Toronto context. It really, for me, is all about our suburbs and this exercise we've been engaged in for many years, which is transforming our suburbs. And, and you've been advocating for some time things like walking and cycling to work. So does that mean a, a more dispersed distribution of employment, for instance? Well, I don't think, let me first say, and I've been asked this a lot over the past several months, employment has fundamentally changed. Um, it will never, we'll never go back to the old way. I think we will be living in a world there, where there is much more of a combination of um, ways that people work, meaning each individual will have a combination. Some days they're at the office, some, day, some days they're working, working from home. And that combination will have a profound impact on commuting and commuting patterns. Because, you know, even building, we're building a multi-billion dollar subway that was going to shift and add only 10% capacity. Well, es estimates right now are that more than 10% of people will not go back to work full time or will be working in odd hours. So if you think about it from the kind of infrastructure we need, that's a profound implication on what happens during rush hour. Like rush hour fundamentally changes when you have even just a small change in the way, in the way people work. Uh, but yes, yesterday, um, yesterday it was revealed that one of the big banks in Canada is actually looking at creating nodal, like we work type spaces in communities across Canada on a very small scale. So these aren't really offices at all. They're like storefronts where 20 people can come work all over their, uh, the country in order to enable people to be able to sometimes work from home, sometimes work from this, this small office. Um, so I think, you know, there's a, we're in a moment of a great transition that opens up significant opportunities to lower and mitigate our environmental footprint. To some extent, we're, we're talking about this in terms of transit and, and travel and, and carbon. Are there other sort of health and, and well-being uh, benefits or issues arising from this? And are you seeing any of that in the current situation across Toronto? Yeah, so, you know, it's really funny, but um, when I was chief planner and we were bringing forward a really aggressive minimum grid, so a minimum cycling network across the entire city, uh, which at that time I was told by the chair of my committee, don't even bring it to city council. Like they won't even look at it. Like they'll just say, you know, go away. Well, now we're in the process of expediting the building of what's be starting to become an, uh, uh, a complex cycling network across the entire city. And what's so interesting about that is that people who 
used to shout about the bike lanes are now using the bike lanes. And now that they're using the bike lanes, one of the first things they start talking about is the impact on their health. And, you know, there's a CEO of a large development company in Toronto who I did a session with uh, on the 2020 declaration, which I think we'll get to. I did a session with him on the 2020 declaration because they wanted to think about the impact of the 2020 declaration as a private sector developer, how they should be building buildings differently. You know, and they're building, you know, thousands and thousands of units. And in that, I talked about cycling and cycling infrastructure, and they did two very interesting things after the session. They now give, um, they now give bikes with all their condo purchases. Um, they now have, have um, bike parking for all condo units, have bike parking associated with them, which before there was just kind of a clump of bike spots. But now they've, like, they've taken the bike parking having a bike repair room in the building, they're taking all that much more seriously. But the part of the story I love best is that uh, about six weeks after we did the session, he said, he emailed me and said, after our session, I went out the next day and I bought myself a bike. You know, this is a guy who probably got, drives like a fancy Tesla. Um, and he said, I've lost weight, I'm healthier and I'm happier than I've been in years. It's, it's changing my life. And so I think that, you know, it's a very personal thing, but we know that the health benefits, the impact on our air quality at a meta level, but the impact on our individual health um, at a very, very specific level are un uncontested. So moving towards that is how we drive our, design our cities. It's just so, uh, it's a phenomenal shift we're seeing. If we pick up the declaration which you were involved in initiating and, and getting out um, almost immediately after the, the COVID lockdown situation. Can you say a bit about it? Who signed up? And, and really linking to what we're saying now is, are there prospects for embedding this shift in expectations and behaviour or is there a risk that things will default back to how they were before? So I'll start by saying that one of the really big reasons why the declaration exists actually has to do with transit because we immediately um, saw when we went into lockdown, no one was using public transit and uh, there were a lot of questions and in the Canadian context, our transit system is very much a user pay system. So when you pay your fare, you're actually paying for the system to operate. So you can imagine in lockdown, when 70% of your users disappear, the service had to go down. And when the service levels started going down, there was a big debate in the city and people started saying, and this has absolutely happened, for the first time in my life, I'm going to go out and buy a car. And seeing that, seeing those links being made and leading to, so I better go buy a car, basically was explosive. Um, for many of us in our industry and myself. Um, and we realized that there was a fork in the road that was emerging and we could, we needed to choose a trajectory as a result of COVID-19. And one trajectory was disastrous for our planet and another trajectory um, was good for our planet. One tra trajectory was disastrous for social inclusion and another tra trajectory would be good for social inclusion. And so the in many ways, realizing that there was a fork in the road um, inspired uh, myself and some colleagues in my team. We wrote the declaration with 20 specific actions. We circulated it amongst a whole series of thought leaders, um, refined it, and then shopped it. And of course, we wanted the biggest signatures we could possibly get on it. And we wanted those signatures to come from a diversity of uh, places public health officials, professionals, developers. We have five of the largest developers in the country signed the 2020 declaration. That's something. Their, their colleagues have taken note that they're making a commitment to actually be a part of climate resilience. Uh, we had um, every former mayor of the city of Toronto signed the declaration and importantly, David Miller, who is now the head of C40 cities. Um, and C40 cities subsequently came out with a not dissimilar document about just a just and green recovery. And it's in the same 
they came with that, out with that probably three or four months after after we released the declaration. But in that same trajectory of justice and climate being a part of of recovery and infrastructure infrastructure spending, we have several former uh, premiers, uh, including. Um, Mike Harcourt, who was the mayor of Vancouver, but also the premier of British Columbia, he signed the declaration. Um, we have many academics, leading academics, Richard Florida signed the, signed the declaration. So the goal was actually to get some names that had some heft that would give some legitimacy to these 20 actions. And, uh, and we wanted it to happen early because we were worried that we were losing the narrative on how a recovery should happen and what to do in light of a, a pandemic. People were saying, this is the end of cities. And I was saying, no way, we have to go deeper into our urbanism. Our urbanism needs to be walkable and inclusive. We need to go deeper. We need to upend single family zoning and ensure that we have neighborhoods where everyone uh, can, can, can live together. So that was really the driver behind creating the declaration is recognizing that we were you know, this goes back to my philosophy background. We were in a fight uh, for the hearts and minds of our political leaders in how they responded to this pandemic in a moment where a lot of people were scared instead of hopeful. And the declaration is about being hopeful, about being able to impact the world around us. Can I pick up that thread of influence and leadership? Um, we're gonna pick up on, on your own mayoral bid, but um, some of the occasions that the people who will be watching and listening will have come across Toronto uh, was in the, the period of Rob Ford. And I just wondered if you could say what it was like working in that context and then lead into how you made the decision to, to run um, for mayor yourself. So um, I was the, uh, a partner in one of the largest planning, design, engineering, and architecture firms that I founded in Canada when I was recruited to the job of chief planner in the city of Toronto. And Rob Ford was mayor. And one of the reasons among several that I took the job, um, including the fact that I had written a letter and said, this is why I would be bad for the job, because I think, I think the job needs to be done in a very different way. And Part of what I talked about was exactly this, about building constituencies for change. Um, and when, you know, when the leaders, and uh, you know, my hat goes off to Peter Milchin, who was the chair, a city councillor who was the chair of planning and growth. So he was an ally of Rob Ford, but he was an architect who I'd worked with for many years, who was um, uh, very passionate about this vision of transformation in the city. So he was the connection to Rob Ford and, and ran a lot, of, a lot of interference. But one of the reasons why I took the job and I quickly created a blog called Own Your City was because during that time period, many of us felt like our city was slipping away from us. Rob Ford wanted to get rid of our streetcars which was mind numbing. There were a lot of things that he was proposing. There was a, a really divisive rhetoric in the city at that time, a them and us rhetoric. He actually removed bike lanes in the city. He was taking us um, in the wrong direction. And so when I be, took on the role of chief planner, in some ways it was me taking a bit of my own medicine and saying, you know what? Um, I'm going to own my city. I'm going to take some ownership over the city that I live in and I'm going to take my expertise and my passion and my energy and I'm going to pour it into my own city because at that point I had already been pouring my energy into cities around the world and, and uh, across Canada. And so I was very fortunate in taking on this role because I'd laid out my mandate very clearly. I said, these are the ways I'm going to do the job differently. And I did the job exactly as I said I would. So there were no surprises. Um, but I also had a city councillor whose committee I reported through who ran interference with the mayor. So that actually gave me some breathing room. He would frequently text me and say, you know, so-and-so was unhappy about this and that just so that you know, but I've got your back. So keep doing what you're doing. So in retrospect, I could never ever have done the job without that city councillor and the way that he played that role and ran interference. Once Rob Ford left and Mayor Tory was elected, it was a completely different dynamic. And you know, 
John Tory was elected because he was seen as the stable alternative to the chaotic um, Rob Ford. And so um, that meant a period where, ironically, it became just as difficult to actually advance transformative change because he came in as, as a status quo mayor and he wanted to be a status quo mayor. Um, and I, at one point I brought in Jeanette Sadat Khan to speak with him to try and inspire him to be a bit more like Bloomberg. And um, after that meeting, he said, look, he said, you know, I just don't, I, I like to move in incremental ways. I move slowly, I'm timid. And that was incredibly frustrating. And so uh, I did my full term as chief planner. I could have renewed, I chose not to re renew because I knew that I was bumping up against political leadership. That in order to do the things that I wanted to do in the role, I was, I, I was having a really significant political problem moving forward. And, you know, getting the King Street pilot through, which was a transformative change to our transit network, um, where we took the cars off of a major corridor and prioritized transit, you know, with the right political leadership, that's an easy project. With the wrong political leadership, it, it takes a piece out of you. You have a lot of battles, you're fighting every day. Um, and so I was, I am and remain incredibly proud that we got that project done, but there should be 15 of them across the city now today. Like we actually demonstrate, we demonstrated the value, we demonstrated that you can get it done. And that was really in many ways the reason why I ran for mayor is because we actually don't need a status quo approach. We need an approach that is visionary and bold and embracing a fundamentally different future. Now to come full circle, Mayor Tory today um, has embraced many of, well, every one of my campaign promises um, and has implemented almost all of them um, it, in a much bigger imp increment than I would have expected. Um, and I continue to be involved in the city politics, you know, as a, as a, as a, a thought leader and towards that end. Um, but it's, you know, I think there's, I always talk about, um, the importance of identifying your own sphere of influence and whatever role you're in, if you're going to advance change, you need to bump up against the edges of your role. And I did that as chief planner. I pushed the role as far as I possibly could. And then I realized, well, now I need a different kind of role if I want to expand, expand the impact and the influence that I'm going to have. Um, and I've become, in the past several years, I've become in some ways much more politicized about our climate emergency. You know, I listen to uh, Greta Thunberg and you know her finger is pointing at me she's pointing at our generation that we've been too complacent we haven't been ambitious enough um, and I feel that within our profession we need to be doing significantly more so the work I'm doing now um, and this you know isn't really in the public domain as much but it will be within the next couple of months I'm working as a developer I'm building housing it's affordable housing but it's also our first project will be carbon neutral um, so bringing together a whole variety of city building objectives to push the way we think about development and society and change um, needs to be where our, our thinking is at within our profession today. So, so you're, you're still influencing a lot of the time by doing as well as advocating. Would, you, would that um, bid to, to be mayor and, and bid to be involved in politics. Is that something you would do again? Or, or would you say in terms of this sphere of influence, you've got other ways of doing that? Well, this is what I would say. So running for politics is a deeply personal, personal decision. And um, I am the first one to advocate that more professionals need to run for politics. Um, we need people who actually have been in the trenches building and designing and working with communities at the grassroots in politics, in, 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 at the community level in, in politics. Um, and that frequently doesn't happen. If we look at political leadership um, all over the world, but definitely in the Canadian context, um, we have a lot of lifers in politics. People who set their aspiration, not as their aspiration isn't something, some ideal, their aspiration is to be a politician. And being a politician is not an end. 
being a politician is a way to achieve certain kinds of change. And I would say we have a crisis of politics because there are too many players that are in politics to be a politician. Um, so I was never, the, the challenge that I have is that what I care about is the outcome. I care about changing the world around me. I care about, uh, and it's, for me, it's about being hopeful in a world where there's a lot to feel hopeless about. To me, it's about being an actor in whatever small way or big way in advancing transformative change. And so for me, I'm not ideological about being a politician as being the best way to do that. I think there's lots of ways to do that. Um, and tons of different players at different levels. And I think for some people being on a planning review panel is really powerful. Um, and so for me, I've had to go through, I didn't know when I ran for office, um, what the best place is for me to do this. But in the interim, right now, I'm actually doing something that, you know, we have big aspirations at my company. We're, we, we're seeking to transform housing in this country. No small thing. And we're seeking to do that from a perspective of building real communities and inclusive communities. Um, we've created a fundamentally different model for building affordable housing and deeply affordable housing to deliver that. So I'm in deep in what I'm doing right now. Will I run again at some point in the future? I don't know, but I feel right now that I'm in a space where I can achieve those outcomes. I definitely won't run in the near future because I'm deep in what I'm doing right now. It feels like you've gone full circle back to the heart of community activism where it all started, um, that it feels a comfortable space for you. Well, in some ways, except now I'm doing it um, not as an activist, but as a professional with an expertise in planning and development. And I'm using that I'm using that expertise to, uh, you know, basically my partner and I, when we created our company, which will be launched in the next several weeks, because we're launching it when we announce our first project. Uh, when we created it, we asked the question, is there a way to use the best of private sector expertise and private capital to deliver at scale a transformative public good? And that's what we've that's what we've been focused on. Thanks, Jennifer. It, it sounds like something we should look out for um, when that comes out. Um, you're very active. You're very animated. You've been very busy for years. Um, some people have asked is what you do in your spare time to relax, or indeed where you go to, or or you know, uh, either virtual or or real. I mean, are there real places like that you like to visit for leisure? Are you a kind of a 24 urbanist who doesn't stop. So, you know, I actually got called out by this, uh, by a friend a few days ago who said to me, um, what are your hobbies? And, um, <laughs> and it was funny because I would say my hobbies, you know, everything always goes full circle because my hobbies are things like my podcast, Invisible City and Within Reach, but they're about cities. So they're not allowed to be my hobbies, but they are because I love them. And I, you know, I find them to be, you know, they are the thing I do for fun. Um, but I love, I love seeing and touring cities and places for fun. That's my hobby. Um, but I'll give you a, a little known fact. Um, I'm in nature and, you know, I, I love being in nature. So we are very blessed in the Canadian context in, in Toronto. We have a phenomenal ravine system, 17 kilometers, 17 percent of our land area in Toronto is ravines and when you're in the ravine you feel like you're in the deep woods so walking in our ravines hiking in our ravines I'm also very I'm an avid uh, cyclist um, road riding is something that I love to do out in uh, outside of the city on our on our country roads and I also spend a lot of time up on Georgian Bay um, which is so you know experiencing the land and the landscape is you know, it's the counterpoint to my urban world, but I also would say it's the reason why I'm so passionate about the importance of bringing nature and natural systems into our cities, because I get sustained when I go through a walk in the woods. That's how I come down. That's when I think, or when I run in the woods. So, um, you know, making that link between the urban and, and other, you know, the, our natural systems, I think is foundational to great urbanism. 
and, it, and it's been particularly noticeable in, in the COVID lockdown situation in cities that access to green space is very important for mental health and uh, supporting communities. In fact, one of the nice things is to see how, how widely they've been shared by people from all ages and all, all cultures and backgrounds. Jennifer, yeah. that, that's a fantastic way to, to, to um, really draw this to a close. And uh, we, we've got a, a lot of depth and background to your, your professional career and, and how you've progressed and a bit about um, uh, your political and, and this issue of influence and shaping things. And it was fascinating to learn about the community activist routes too, and not mm -hmm. least where you got your confidence in presenting in front of audiences, which um, uh, many of us also aspire to. Um, I've got one final question, which uh, not everyone will know what this means. Are you a Drake fan and have you met him? <laughs> I have not met Drake, um, but I have met Margaret Atwood. Uh, and one of my claims to fame is, is that she apparently voted for me in the election. Um, I have met Margaret Atwood, but not Drake. <laughs> but I've seen him at basketball games. So there you go, at Raptors games. Fantastic. Um, Jennifer, thanks very much for your time. I know you've got a, a lot of work to do today. We'll look out for uh, the, the, well, we're going to be studying the document, the declaration, of course, and we might get you more involved to explain that. But good luck with the company and the new work on affordable and uh, uh, social housing and so on. Um, and good luck with the next stages of your career. Thanks for contributing today. Thank you, Kevin. This was fabulous. A lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks everyone for your contribution and we'll track the comments and questions. Thanks a lot. Thanks Steve very much.